We're working under the sponsorship of, of Simtrop at the University of Palankaraya and we're carrying out biodiversity research. Mm -hmm. Our, I suppose, flagship species that we're studying are the orangutans, the gibbons and the clouded leopards. We've also, uh, a couple of years ago, started studying the red langurs. We're also looking at um, all levels of biodiversity within the, within the forest. So we're looking at ants and butterflies, frogs, uh, birds, and um, we've also started doing a project on insects general insects so we're trying to understand as much as we can about the forest we're also looking at forest regeneration and how the forest recovers after natural disturbance like tree falls also human disturbance for example um, cutting canals into the forest or creating gaps to hunt uh, the flying foxes The research with the orangutans started just carrying out um, density surveys. Uh, once it was discovered that orangutans lived in that forest, we realised we knew nothing about them. There was very little information about orangutans in Peak Swamp Forest. So the research was built on carrying out the density surveys to get an estimate of population. And from that, um, my colleagues Simon Husson and Helen Mora Barnard started uh, habituating the orangutans so that we could follow them because they're all completely wild, no reintroduced orangutans. And if we can follow them, we can see where they go, what they eat, how they use the forest, what sort of ranges they need, what size of forest they need to live in. Uh, we can also get information about uh, the population. We can start to see how often they have new infants. And as uh, the more we get to know the animals, the more that we can follow them. And they'll follow them over a long period of time to really understand more about their ecology and how they use the forest. We think there's only been one event that's really affected the, the orangutans. It was a combination of pressure from uh, the edge of the forest of uh, illegal logging pushing in and uh, fires happening in the centre of the forest that pushed the orangutans into a habitat that's very low productivity, naturally quite poor productivity. And because they were pushed into this area, there wasn't actually enough food to support all of the orangutans. And we think the population crashed from about 12,000 orangutans throughout the entire uh, Sabango catchment. Uh, down to about 7,000 of, of what the numbers are now. The subsequent fire events have not been uh, as bad, although they've, they've been bad in other ways, but we don't think that the subsequent fire events, so 2002, 2006 and 2009, have had too much of an impact on the population. What we think is happening though is that these prolonged fire events, which produce a lot of smoke up in the atmosphere, are having an effect on the trees because the trees are not able to photosynthesize as much, so there's a lot more um, death in the trees, leaves are falling and uh, dying as are flowers. And then there's a long-term knock-on effect as to how much fruit the, the trees can produce because they haven't been able to gain enough nutrition during the, sort of the, the period when there's a lot of smoke. Uh, we're still analysing the data on that, but it looks like that the, these smoke events actually have quite a long-term knock-on effect for the trees, which ultimately affects the orangutans, because if they don't have enough food, then there's a problem. One of the things that we have discovered um, is that the, these very long smoke, smoke periods, you know, three months of, of bad smoke, it does seem to be having an effect uh, on the animals themselves. Obviously, if they're breathing in all of this smoke, it's it must be having some health problems with them, specifically with, with the gibbons who sing every morning to the, defend their territory. Their singing is greatly reduced. They don't sing as much during the smoke season. Um, they also seem to travel far less. It's obviously having some a, a health effect uh, on, on them, and we would expect that to be the same for probably all the animals in the forest. I think there are probably a lot of lessons that can be learned from Africa and I think it's great when you have uh, meetings like this where it's actually, it's not the foreigners who are kind of presenting ideas, it's, you know, we have delegates from Africa who have arrived today who are talking to uh, people from the national parks, from, to, to people from Simtrop, so talking to the Indonesians about their own experiences and I think that sharing of ideas is, is, is very, very good. A lot of the national parks in Africa are a lot older than the ones in Indonesia and so there maybe have hopefully have a lot of lessons that can be learned, maybe mistakes that can be avoided in the future. So I think bringing, bringing people like that together, although it's expensive, is, is a very good thing that, that you're actually getting from you know, the people that work in Africa directly to the Indonesians, getting them together to be able to, to share ideas and, and discuss problems.